Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul by Douglas Adams. So this is Dirk Gently book number two. You might be familiar with Dirk Gently if you've seen the Netflix series. I actually watched the series before reading the books, but it's not necessarily a problem because they, they take the same concept and Dirk Gently is a character, but they have totally different storylines. Actually, I found when I was reading this, I wasn't picturing the characters as the actors or anything like that. So... If you've already seen the Netflix series and you want to see where it all began, don't worry, it's not going to be ruined. So, also, how cool is that little holographic tea tray on the front? So I'm going to read you the blurb here. When a passenger check-in desk at Terminal 2, Heathrow Airport, shot up through the roof engulfed in a ball of orange flame, the usual people tried to claim responsibility. First the IRA, then the PLO and the gas board. Even British Nuclear Fuels rushed out a statement to the effect that the situation was completely under control, that it was a one in a million chance, that there was hardly any radioactive leakage at all, and that the site of the explosion would make a nice location for a day out with the kids and a picnic, before finally having to admit that it wasn't actually anything to do with them at all. No rational cause could be found for the explosion. It was simply designated an act of God. But, thinks Dirk gently, which God? And why? What God would be hanging around Terminal 2 of Heathrow Airport trying to catch the 1537 to Oslo? Funnier than Psycho, more chilling than Jeeves takes charge, shorter than War and Peace, the new Dirk Gently novel, The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. So this is book number two in the series, there are actually only the two books. This is the one I preferred actually, and the reason for this is because of the Norse mythology element to it. So, you know, it mentioned there in the blurb, the act of God, Thor is a character in this, which is great. We also have the lurking fridge, let me read to you about the lurking fridge. Let's go through and see what my uh, little sticky tabs say. This is quite a long excerpt, but I'm going to read you a long excerpt because it will give you a feel for Adams' writing style if you've not read him before. It was now, Dirk reckoned, fully three months since the fridge door had been opened, and each of them was grimly determined not to be the one to open it first. The fridge no longer merely stood there in the corner of the kitchen. It actually lurked. Dirk could quite clearly remember the day on which the thing had started lurking. It was about a week ago when Dirk had tried a simple subterfuge to trick Alina, the old bat's name was Alina, pronounced to rhyme with cleaner, which was an irony that Dirk now no longer relished, into opening the fridge door. The subterfuge had been deftly deflected and had nearly rebounded horribly on Dirk. He had resorted to the strategy of going to the local mini-market to buy a few simple groceries. Nothing contentious, a little milk, some eggs, some bacon, a carton or two of chocolate custard and a simple half pound of butter. He had left them innocently on top of the fridge as if to say, oh, when you have a moment, perhaps you could pop these inside. When he had returned that evening, his heart bounded to see that they were no longer on top of the fridge. They were gone! They had not been merely moved aside or put on a shelf, they were nowhere to be seen. She must finally have capitulated and put them away, in the fridge and she would surely have cleaned it out once it was actually open. For the first and only time, his heart swelled with warmth and gratitude towards her, and he was about to fling open the door of the thing in relief and triumph when an eighth sense, at the last count Dirk reckoned he had eleven, warned him to be very, very careful, and to consider first where Alina might have put the cleared out contents of the fridge. A nameless doubt gnawed at his mind as he moved noiselessly towards the garbage bin beneath the sink. Holding his breath, he opened the lid and looked. There, nestling in the folds of the fresh black bin liner, were his eggs, his bacon, his chocolate custard, and his simple half pound of butter. Two milk bottles stood rinsed and neatly lined up by the sink into which their contents had presumably been poured. She had thrown it away. Rather than open the fridge door, she had thrown his food away. He looked round slowly at the grimy, squat, white monolith, and that was the exact moment at which he realised without a shadow of a doubt that his fridge had now begun seriously to lurk. And if you're anything like me, you have had a lurking fridge from time to time. Our fridge is actually starting to lurk a little bit again. It's got a puddle of something at the bottom of it. And I don't want to clean it, so I'm, I'm hanging on and hoping that Becca's going to cave. We have here where Dirk takes on a client and it says, The only thing the client had insisted upon in the midst of this almost superhuman fit of reasonableness was that Dirk had to be there, absolutely had, had, had to be there ready, functioning and alert, without fail, without even the merest smidgen of an inkling of failure at 6.30 in the morning. Absolute. Well, he was just going to have to see reason about that as well. 6.30 was clearly a preposterous time and he, the client, obviously hadn't meant it seriously. A civilised 6.30 for 12 noon was almost certainly what he had in mind, and if he wanted to cut up rough about it, Dirk would have no option but to start handing out some serious statistics. Nobody got murdered before lunch, but nobody. People weren't up to it. 
You needed a good lunch to get both the blood sugar and bloodlust levels up. Dirk had the figures to prove it. I got up at half eleven today and it's the earliest I've got up for about a week. We have this great bit as well where he shows up to this crime scene where somebody's dead and uh, the inspector, he goes, You know, these smart Alex show-off suicides really make me tired. They only do it to annoy. Suicide, said Dirk. Jilks glanced round at him. Windows secured with iron bars half an inch thick, he said. Door locked from the inside with the key still in the lock. Furniture piled against the inside of the door. French windows to the patio locked with mortise door bolts. No signs of a tunnel. If it was murder, then the murderer must have stopped to do a damn fine gl job of glazing on the way out. Except that all the putty's old and painted over. I haven't time to fiddle around on this one. Obviously suicide and just done to be difficult. I have half a mind to do the deceased for wasting police time. I like, that's what I like about these books, is that Adams kind of uses these tropes and then subverts them, you know. We have this moment, a character called Kate, she's the one who ends up hanging around with Thor. And she's in hospital and she says, uh, The air in here is horrible. It smells like a vacuum cleaner's armpit. Again, beautiful way with words. Almost poetic, one would say. We have this moment as well where this, this character starts basically saying what uh, somebody else is saying on the television. And this reminded me of Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill, because the guy who was the ghost in that, before he died, his like, party trick was he'd listen to the radio and say what the preacher on the radio was saying at the same time as him. Everything that Elwes said was then said just a moment later on the television by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Dustin Hoffman. It seems that Mr. Elwes here knows everything that this mo Mr. Hoffman is going to say just a second or so before he says it. It is not, I have to say, something that Mr. Hoffman would be very pleased about if he knew. Att attempts have been made to alert the gentleman to the problem, but he has proved to be somewhat difficult to reach. We have a joke here as well that Kate says. She goes, you must have heard it. Well, we we're terribly worried about Uncle Henry. He thinks he's a chicken. Well, why don't you send him to the doctor? Well, we would, only we need the eggs. And this guy is like, oh, wow, that's that's some really deep stuff. I want to wanna know another one. So uh, they tell the joke of why does the chicken cross the road? And he goes, and the answer is to get to the other side. I see. And what does this chicken do when it arrives at the other side of the road? History does not relate, replied Kate promptly. I think that falls outside the scope of the joke, which really only concerns itself with the journey of the chicken across the road and the chicken's reasons for making it. It's a little like a Japanese haiku in that respect. I see, said Standish once again, and frowned. And do these uh, jokes require the preparatory use of any form of artificial stimulant? Depends on the joke, depends on who it's been told to. Hmm, well I must say you've certainly opened up a rich furrow for me, miss. Uh, it seems to me that the whole field of humour could benefit from close and immediate scrutiny. Clearly we need to sort out the jokes which have any kind of genuine psychological value from those which merely encourage drug abuse and should be stopped. I think he's rather missing the point there. We have this line really made me laugh. There's a car accident and someone goes, Don't you ever look in the mirror? No. Why not? It's, it's under the seat. Because it's came off and they're... <laughs> Uh, it's less funny when you have to explain the joke. We have here as well, there's an author in this called Howard Bell, and he has uh, what, what is described as the perfect bestseller's name. David says it's the first thing any publisher looks for in a new author. Not, is his stuff any good, or is his stuff any good once you get rid of all the adjectives, but is his last name nice and short and his first name just a bit longer? You see, the Bell is done in huge silver letters, and the Howard fits neatly across the top in slightly narrower ones. Instant trademark, it's publishing magic. Once you've got a name like that, then whether you can actually write or not is a minor matter. Which in Howard Bell's case is now a significant bonus. But it's a very ordinary name if you write it down in the normal way, like it is here, you see. There's this moment where Kate meets Thor and she goes, I've been reading about you, she challenged the Thunder God. Where's your beard? He took the book, a one-volume encyclopedia, from her hands and glanced at it before tossing it aside contemptuously. Ha! He said. I shaved it off. When I was in Wales. He scowled at the memory. What were you doing in Wales, for heaven's sake? Counting the stones, he said with a shrug, and went to stare out the window. Because his father, Odin, made him count all the stones, but he lost track of them somewhere in Glamorgan. Here we have where Dirk is quitting smoking, which I did over three months ago now. In fact, today I'm about to hit... Uh... I'm about to hit 100 days without a cigarette. Look, here we go. You see that? All right. Three months, eight days. Wee. So, um, yeah. Cigarettes clearly intended to make themselves a major problem for Dirk tonight. 
For most of the day, except for when he'd woken up, and except for again shortly after he'd woken up, and except for when he had just encountered the revolving head of Jeffrey Anstey, which was understandable, and also except for when he'd been in the pub with Kate, he had had absolutely no cigarettes at all. Not one. They were out of his life. Forsworn utterly. He didn't need them. He could do without them. They merely nagged at him like mad and made his life a living hell, but he decided he could handle that. So yeah, that's all I'm going to say about Dirk Gently, and well this is book 2 specifically, The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. But overall I enjoyed it, I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5, a very strong 4 out of 5. It's almost a 4.25 out of 5, but I thought there's no point giving it a 0.25. So we're just giving it a 4 out of 5, but I did enjoy it, would recommend it. Obviously read book 1 first, although you could read them out of order, it wouldn't make too much, too much of a difference really. Yeah, it was good. So on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.